Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, another Canadian Lenders Association webinar. Uh, we have really exciting uh, uh, content and conversation for you guys uh, uh, today. Um, a big thank you to MLT Aikens for uh, preparing this presentation and for fielding questions from uh, CLA members. Um, uh, I, um, you know, I encourage you to, to you know, register for you know, future events that we do. Uh, we cover a lot of really, really great, meaningful content for uh, lenders uh, across Canada. Um, and uh, if you, uh, you know, miss a little bit of this presentation, that's totally fine. We'll send you a recording uh, afterwards so you can go and re review all of this material uh, on your own time. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you again and hand things off to uh, Adam, who's uh, going to be your moderator. Adam? Hi, uh, my name is Adam Merrick. And first of all, welcome to the Cybersecurity and Mandatory Privacy Breach, a post-Halloween horror story webinar. Um, I am the practice group leader for the Edmonton office of MLT Aikens. We are a six office law firm that extends across Western Canada with offices in Winnipeg, Regina, Saskatoon, Calgary, Edmonton, and Vancouver. Not only do we service the provinces of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia, but we have lawyers who are called to the bar and who can practice in Ontario, the Yukon Territories, and the Northwest Territories. My main practice areas include commercial lending, both at the bank level, as well as at the private level, which includes mezzanine financing, takeout financing, and syndicated type loans. I also act for a number of private corporations, both small and big, and co-lead the Edmonton Science and Technology Group. I would like to introduce our two speakers. I'll start with Randy Brunet, who is a partner in our Regina office and is the leader of our firm-wide science and technology group. Randy's practice areas include freedom of information, information technology, privacy and cybersecurity, blockchain and cryptocurrency, and healthcare. Our other speaker is Christelle Priel, who is an associate from our Regina office, and Christelle practices in the areas of science and technology, privacy and cybersecurity, healthcare, anti-spam compliance, and also assists credit unions and cooperatives charities and not-for-profits. I hope you enjoy our webinar and if you have any questions please feel free to ask them through the, the question box category at the bottom of your screen. We will be monitoring incoming questions throughout the presentation and there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Randall, uh, Randall, <laughs> Randy and Christelle uh, over to you. Thanks very much Adam. Uh, so as mentioned, this is going to be called a post Halloween horror story. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the topic that we talk about is not only a post Halloween, it's sort of an everyday type horror story um, that we'll all have seen in the news lately. So uh, just to give you a little bit of a rundown of, of the presentation, we'll just start with a couple of pointers about why this is important to keep in mind, not that anybody really needs that reminder at this point. We'll walk a little bit through the legal framework just to set out some of the key requirements for privacy and cybersecurity as you're thinking about what you need to put in place to protect yourselves uh, from these types of attacks. Um, we'll mention a couple of cases that have some interesting takeaways for financial institutions. Uh, and then we'll turn it over to Randy to talk through some of the cybersecurity issues and tools that we can put in place, uh, not only to prepare for potential attacks, but also then to deal with those. And then, as Adam mentioned, uh, we'll finish off with a little bit of time for a Q&A session. So just to start off with, as everybody knows, this is something that we're seeing in the news almost every day. And we've all heard that it's not an if it happens, it's a when it happens, unfortunately, regardless of the size of our organizations. And so it's really important to keep in mind for not only yourselves, but also for your customers and clients that you work with. Um, everyone is working with data. Um, there's a constantly changing uh, landscape of potential threats. 
we'll talk about some of the common ones that we're seeing and, and Randy will chat about some of this in the cybersecurity portion um, at the end when he talks about some of the phases. Um, but this is really something that is an everyday thing to be aware of and something that we dynamically have to keep adjusting to to help prepare ourselves. And of course, then there are those legal requirements to protect the information that we have. Um, and so that's where we'll touch on those legal framework pieces. Uh, so there's a number of potential consequences. I don't need to go through these. You'll be aware of them already. Um, it used to be that one of the biggest pieces under our current privacy legislation framework uh, was this concept of reputational risk. Um, and there's a number of related uh, issues. So um, your reputation is impacted um, when you experience a cybersecurity incident, um, your operations might be halted. That can be a quite a significant impact for organizations if you don't have the right uh, protections in place. There's the possibility of litigation. Um, and financial risk used to be a smaller consideration, uh, but just yesterday, um, and I'll touch a little bit upon this when I talk about the framework, um, but just yesterday they announced, um, the federal government announced a number of changes um, that are being proposed to our privacy landscape in Canada and those would carry quite significant financial risks and costs as well. So um, those will become a much more significant part of the consideration for when we think about cybersecurity risks. So with that, I'll touch on the legal framework, um, just to give you a little bit of an outline um, of the requirements. Um, I won't talk in a lot of detail about all of this. And um, we, we saw a little bit of a list of the people who are attending and we have a big range of, of industries, not just in the financial area. And so um, some of the organizations are public organizations, some are private. So um, we'll, we'll touch on some of the key ones. But it'll be important to keep in mind uh, the specific framework that applies to you as we talk about this. So the way that we've structured this outline and to talk about the privacy legal framework, because that really is the key uh, framework that applies for cybersecurity that sets out our requirements when we start thinking about what we need to do to protect information. Um, there is generally a number of different privacy laws, might be federal, might be provincial, that apply to how you deal with personal information. So essentially anything about an identifiable individual can be captured in that category. And so that's really what this privacy framework applies to. Um, often when you're dealing with the type of information that many of you will have, that financial information, you're dealing with quite sensitive information. And so the standards are much higher for you to protect that information uh, when it comes to thinking about your cybersecurity requirements. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about PEPIDA. Um, this is the federal legislation that currently applies across Canada. I'll mention some of the patchwork on the next slide. Um, but this is really where our framework uh, comes from and the key requirements. It also reflects the common law. So if you don't have any specific legislation that applies to you, this is what would be looked to for best practices. So it's always a good fallback when you're thinking about uh, what your consideration should be. And so PEPIDA will apply to you um, even if your organization is subject to specific provincial legislation uh, in your province, such as BC and Alberta um, and Quebec, uh, PEPIDA will still apply to you whenever your information is leaving your province or uh, perhaps leaving Canada. So if you're using a service provider that's providing services from outside of Canada, it's important to keep in mind that PEPIDA might apply as well. So as I mentioned, PEPIDA applies whenever there isn't specific private sector legislation in provinces. There's only a few that have those. Um, we have a number of changes pending. I mentioned at the outset of the presentation yesterday, they announced a whole new framework um, that would essentially replace uh, PEPIDA and introduce some significant changes uh, to, to what's currently in place. Uh, these changes are being proposed. Um, some of them have been discussed in Ontario with the proposed legislation there. Uh, some of them are in Manitoba and similarly proposed legislation there. But really these significant changes are being proposed to catch PEPIDA up with um, what has been a long time 
coming. So Pepita was last updated a few years ago, um, but there's been a number of changes in technology and, and how society operates. And so privacy laws were really behind. Um, and we're seeing a number of privacy laws developed, for example, in the European Union. Um, California has quite strict laws now. And so um, the changes to Pepita really reflect some of the requirements to catch up to those laws. So just to mention a couple of the things, I won't spend a lot of time here, um, and we actually have a blog that we just posted yesterday about some of the key pieces if you guys are interested to have a look at what some of the more specifics are. Um, and these changes aren't in effect yet, they're just being proposed, we don't have a lot of guidelines on the timeline, unfortunately. Um, but so some of the significant ones, I mentioned one at the start, the financial risk. So uh, the Pepitas, um, under Pepita, the commissioner had very limited ability to, to really make any kind of enforcement decisions or to uh, require companies to comply with what their obligations are under Pepita. Um, but um, the, the new legislation as it's proposed would give the commissioner significant enforcement powers um, and could require organizations to comply uh, with their obligations under PEPIDA, but also to order really significant um, financial penalties, including up to 5% of your global revenue or up to 25 million for significant uh, breaches. So um, that's quite quite a lot more significant than what was previously in place. We had previously just seen some nominal financial damage awards in the privacy world. And so that's something that I think um, if eyebrows haven't been raised about privacy requirements yet, um, they will be uh, going forward. Um, and these are much closer to what is in place in other jurisdictions. And so when we have this new framework coming into place, um, we'll have to see how this impacts uh, what's in place in the other provinces. Uh, so this really is a changing area that we'll have to monitor on an ongoing basis uh, to see what your specific requirements are. Uh, I mentioned the European Union, so if you deal with any residents of the European Union, uh, similarly with California, if you have Californian residents, um, those jurisdictions have quite significant privacy laws that you will be required to comply with above and beyond um, the Canadian requirements. Um, so those are additional pieces to keep your eye on when you're thinking about what your framework is. And again, we have this patchwork, so you may have to comply with a number of different uh, different requirements depending on um, on where where you're operating. And this can be quite uh, interesting. Um, let's call it that. And when you're dealing with notifications of of uh, individuals who are um, spanning essentially the world, so you're you're required to to meet a number of notification requirements in a number of different jurisdictions. I'll work with a number of different uh, commissioners. Many of the European Union uh, commissioners and regulators don't have um, any English uh, versions of the notification requirements. So um, you have to quickly learn some Greek. And so it's, uh, it's, it can be quite interesting. Uh, again, let's just leave it at that. So it's something to be better prepared for than have to work out when you're just running into the problem. So all of the Canadian uh, privacy legislation, including the new legislation, is really based on these 10 privacy principles. Uh, some of you will be familiar with them already, and I've bolded the ones that really apply to cybersecurity. Um, there's more information on the Privacy Commissioner's website if anyone's interested in, in reading more about them, um, and I won't cover them in a lot of detail. Um, but some of the key things for cybersecurity are things like Whenever you have information in your control, so you have your customer or client's information, you stay responsible for that, even if it's transferred to a service provider. So someone who's providing IT services um, or hosting that information outside um, of your organization, you are accountable and responsible um, and ultimately financially responsible if anything goes wrong with that information. Um, so you're required to put a comparable level of protection in place and make sure that it's a appropriately safeguarded while the service provider um, has access to that information. 
Um, again, with financial information, that's quite sensitive. So the standard is much higher for you. Um, and um, these are the type of contractual measures that, for example, that you might put in place with a service provider, but there's a number of others that you'll have to put in place um, to, to meet your requirements from a cybersecurity perspective um, to protect that information. Um, and this concept of just being open, um, being transparent about where information is stored, making sure people consent to what you're doing with their information. This is an underlying uh, principle that uh, we'll see a number of times um, in the cybersecurity context. So um, just to set a bit of the framework for Randy's discussion of the different phases of a cybersecurity incident, um, we have these breach notification requirements um, notifications are mandatory um, for any organizations that are currently subject to, to PEPIDA um, and also um, any provincial uh, sector organizations in Alberta. Um, and so this really is going to require a case by case assessment whenever you have a breach of your security safeguards and there's some sort of inappropriate or unauthorized use or access to personal information. Um, this really requires you to start assessing whether or not and what notifications are required. Um, as I mentioned, there's some similar requirements in other jurisdictions, Alberta is one of them, and certainly the EU and California are others that you'll have to consider mandatory notifications. Um, and so typically the requirements and under PEPIDA, the requirements do break into four categories. So they're the notifications to the affected individuals. Um, essentially, this is to prevent or to enable them to mitigate the harm and prevent further harm to themselves that results from that breach. Um, you might need to notify the, the regulator. Uh, depending on, on what um, the applicable regulator is, perhaps it's the federal commissioner. You might need to notify other organizations that may be able to take steps to further prevent the harm. So, for example, um, if you're working with another financial institution um, and that financial institution is able to take steps uh, to mitigate the harm, they should be notified as well. Sometimes the police is, is an organization that falls under this other category. Um, and then the, the last piece is to maintain appropriate records. So um, the federal commissioner in, in the annual review this year uh, indicated that almost no organizations or a very low percentage of organizations are meeting their requirements with respect to keeping appropriate records. So uh, not only are you required to consider whether notification is uh, required, um, but you may also need to keep records um, and it's required for kind of any breach essentially under PEPIDA. So something to keep in mind. And again, we'll talk about this a bit more when Randy gets into this, but uh, the threshold really is whether there's a real risk of significant harm. And so uh, this is something that's consistent across uh, the different uh, privacy uh, frameworks. Um, and, and we'll see some of the regulatory frameworks have a similar requirement as well. Um, again, this is gonna be a very case by case specific assessment that you have to look at what was impacted and how it can be used, what was done, how it was lost, that kind of thing. So just in addition to the, the legislation that sets out that framework, we have this regulatory framework. I won't go through all of these, but it's something to keep in mind. You might have additional sources that might be specifically relevant to you. Um, We've included a little bit of extra detail here again, just so that you have that for reference, easy reference as a starting point later. Um, but um, OSFI requirements are one of the examples that might be specifically relevant to some of the organizations on the call. Um, you might be directly subject to this or have decided to comply with it on a best practices basis. Um, but the, so for federally regulated financial institutions, there's a number of additional characteristics um, that you might need to consider in a in addition to privacy requirements um, that you may, may need to, um, to notify the federal regulator on that side as well. So uh, something to keep in mind that you have this additional regulatory layer. So if you decide to notify a privacy regulator, typically you're also required to notify OSFI if you're subject to that framework. So again, not going to go through this. Randy was just making a joke about lawyers, including way too much detail. Um, and this is one of those slides. So it's for your reference. I won't read through all of it. 
Um, and then the last piece is we have cases that are being decided, um, whether it's by courts in the context of torts, whether it's as part of class actions. Um, there's a whole range of additional pieces. Sometimes it's guidelines, sometimes it's uh, other reference and resource materials provided that really set out additional things that we have to keep in mind and what those best practices are. So again, a constantly changing um, framework. So there's a few cases here that uh, we've included that are specifically relevant uh, to financial institutions. I'll only touch on the first two because they relate uh, to cybersecurity and, and are sort of recent interesting uh, pieces to keep in mind. Um, but um, this, this decision that I have here um, is important to consider um, if you're looking at the types of safeguards that you have in place. Uh, the commissioner really reviewed um, some of the minimum kind of expectations that they would consider that organizations that have financial information have in place whenever they're working um, with service providers who have access to that information. Um, there's a couple of points. So making sure that you have those appropriate safeguards, you know, that's a good place to check um, the commissioner's decision to make sure you sort of have at least kind of what they have referenced there. Um, but you're also required to notify individuals and that goes back to this kind of transparency consent uh, piece that um, if individuals information will be stored outside of Canada, they should be advised of that fact. Um, and one more piece um, that's interesting to just keep in mind that we'll talk about the cybersecurity considerations um, is this um, idea of, of the reuse of information, of uh, breached information. So something that might um, have been stolen from one cybersecurity incident um, may often be used um, in another cybersecurity incident. So um, a lot of these cyber criminals, criminals are really using a range of information from a range of different sources um, to better target um, target their attacks. And so um, we're seeing this in the context of, of, uh, of phone calls often. So there's often all kinds of phishing schemes. Phone calls is a common one for financial institutions, um, but, um, but it's often done through email as well. And um, Randy will chat about some more of these uh, examples um, when we turn it over to him. Um, but, but often what's being done is, you know, a phone call will be made and someone will have all of the information that they, they, that you typically ask for to verify that someone is who they say they are because they've obtained it from all these other sources, including the dark web, maybe other um, incidents have occurred that, that they've been able to obtain this information. And so um, they're able to take a number of different steps because they are, um, passing, bypassing those initial uh, few tests that you might have in place. And so um, a lot of organizations that we've, we've assisted work through this have had to upgrade um, their training um, because often the, the kind of human component of this is the biggest thing to deal with um, when, when you're able to um, make sure that the people who are taking kind of the, these frontline calls and dealing with this are better able to identify red flags and are better able to make sure that they go through all the extra safeguards, that puts your organization at a much better place. Um, similarly, in email, um, that information that's been obtained from other places, sometimes from public sources, um, can often be used um, by, these, by these attackers to seem very legitimate. So they'll send a very urgent email to, to please transfer this or do this quickly or log in here um, to help them. It'll seem to come from, from a senior uh, leader in the organization um, and you, you everything looks quite legitimate and lines up with what the personal information you might even so so someone might be emailing from you know the golf course and and uh, they're stuck somewhere and and maybe they just happen to post that on their social media but now the cyber criminal has used that to to, to work on sort of that human um, aspect um, and and abuses that information to to commit some uh, wire um, or other financial frauds through email so um, that human component is a big part that we'll talk about and that you'll see uh, is a reoccurring theme 
in a lot of a lot of these instances. So, as I mentioned, I included a few other reports um, that are just interesting for your reference. Uh, one of these, for example, not collecting sensitive information when you don't need it, don't keep it if you don't need it. Um, those, those types of things can help you to lower your risk if there is an attack. Um, and um, the other types of considerations, for example, when you're receiving requests for personal information and you're relying on exemptions, making sure that you um, only release that when you have an exemption at, or, and or you have the appropriate consent. Um, these are all part of those uh, larger principles that we've talked about. And so this is another similar one um, where you have to actually make sure that you can rely on exemption. So uh, just because the police contact you and they need certain information is not sufficient um, for you to be able to release that information to them um, unless you have the appropriate um, uh, authority and limit the information that you share. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Randy um, to chat to you about the cybersecurity issues and tools and to walk through some of those cybersecurity components. Christelle, we, we have one question and um, the question is, is what does PI stand for? Personal information, yeah. So personal information is essentially any of that information about identifiable individuals. And sometimes you hear about PHI as well. So that's personal health information. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Right on, thanks Christelle. Um, so I'm going to uh, jump into a discussion of the cybersecurity issues and a couple things. So I'm both an IT professional and a lawyer. Uh, one of my clients referred to me as a double nerd. I would consider myself more to be double winner. Um, but one of the things that I'm going to try to identify as I go through this presentation is to try to identify for you where we've seen real and practical um, challenges that seem to, seem to create gaps within organizations. And one of the biggest ones is really the communication between the IT professionals in the organization and the policy compliance people and the business people in the organization. Uh, most IT professionals, they're trained to look for ways to share information. It's the way they've been trained from an IT perspective. They're trained to look for ways of sharing information within the organization. And they're also very, very focused on the technical safeguards. But one of the challenges, of course, is you can have a tremendously well-protected technical environment and then simply have one of your employees who then makes a mistake and uh, provides their password or their information to a cyber criminal who then gets by all of your fantastic technical security and gets into the system. And so, um, and one of the challenges can be is a tremendously locked down system when uh, cybersecurity gets inside it, often within the system, people haven't layered the security because they think they have such a great outer shell. So I'm, I'll uh, try to identify a few of those situations. And one of them really is the idea that you cannot leave IT security just to your IT professionals. It has to be an organizational uh, view and an organizational view that's really focused on security and that cybersecurity is simply part of your overall security uh, strategy and security environment. Uh, so again, that's, that's one of the probably where we've seen um, gaps where people have done reviews afterwards, they found that that tended to be the gap was the poor communication between the IT professionals and the policy and compliance people. Again, I'll often say it's like uh, um, IT professionals speak their own language, and often it can be difficult to interpret that language. Um, and so again, it's back to if you're the business person or the compliance person, don't leave the meeting until you actually understand what the IT professional is talking about and understand the risks. Now, um, I'm going to turn just to um, a couple of uh, sort of cybersecurity issues that are, that have, um, are probably more topical. Um, Cybersecurity um, or cyber criminals are exploiting fear and reactions to COVID as a way into systems. Lots of people's home networks are badly, um, badly secured. 
Um, they have all, they have their, you know, their kids are on the network uh, downloading the new um, episode of The Mandalorian, uh, which I understand if you get it illegally, it comes with a whole bunch of nice viruses attached to it. And so um, at-home at security is just not the same as it would be in the office. And this also, again, creates this idea that they can collect partial information from different sources and then come to your organization with an awful lot of good, an awful lot of in background information. So it just means that you have to step up your, uh, your, your uh, security. One of the other pieces, of course, is the psychological impact of COVID and what people are, are calling, you know, basically COVID fatigue. People have been in a heightened sense of, of concern for a long time now. And so what can happen is that can create a series of triggers. Someone can send an email saying, you know, urgent COVID, um, you know, uh, COVID outbreak at work. Please respond to this uh, email immediately or please do this or please do that. So again, it's important that um, when you're providing training to your individual, to your individual employees, that you include specific training to COVID and specific training that's focused to at-home environments. So various strategies that uh, cyber, cyber criminals are using, I mean, the, the phishing and fraudulent email campaigns are, are getting very common, uh, wire fraud, text messages. One of the key things, and um, uh, I would encourage everyone, if you're ever subject to a ransomware attack, please make sure that you get some outside help because um, there are times when you may need to negotiate with the cyber criminal and there are organizations that are professionals at dealing with this. So don't, uh, don't feel alone, especially if you're in that circumstance. There's lots of expertise now, way more than there was four or five years ago and lots of third party help you can get when you're actually involved in a cybersecurity incident. Okay, Christelle, if we just move on. The phases of a privacy incident, from an IT perspective, IT systems are complicated, IT strategies are complicated. And so one of the ways of trying to deal with complication is to in, include process. And so this is a really simple process diagram on how to, on how to sort of continue to improve your privacy and uh, security preparation as you run into incidents as you run into notification, as you run into record keeping, goes all the way back to preparation again to have, create a continuous improvement loop. Um, from an IT perspective, your uh, IT systems are under attack every day. And one of the good things um, to have within your IT system reporting is that your IT folks are actually reporting the number of incidents that are happening that they're dealing with that they don't believe create a security or privacy incident, but just to help with that continuous improvement. And like I said, the communication between your IT professionals and your chief security officer and the compliance people really is important. And creating that regular connection, like a regular monthly meeting where you talk about incidents and where you do the, the sorry, where you talk about incidents, talk about risks. The creating the process that's a regular meeting, a regular connection, can really help reduce your overall risk. Uh, next uh, slide. So phase one on preparation. A cybersecurity uh, preparedness strategy is two main objectives. Again, it's you're minimizing the chance of a successful breach and you're also mitigating the effects of the breach. And one thing you'll hear discussed often in uh, cybersecurity world is layering your security. So within your systems, you've got your systems basically layered and disconnected. So if one system happens to be subject to a breach, it doesn't necessarily inf impact your other systems. And once again, there, the, um, the ability and the third party expertise out there now to help develop some very sophisticated cybersecurity strategies is just way different than it was a few years ago. So if you've had a cybersecurity review you know, a few years ago, the new strategies and uh, things like um, ongoing monitoring, et cetera, um, are things that uh, that are that are relatively new services, and it's something to a uh, good checkpoint for your cybersecurity plan. And as I'll probably say more than five times, cybersecurity is not an IT issue. Um, security has to fit into your entire organization. So cybersecurity preparedness also is focused on risk mitigation 
not perfection. So it's progress, not perfection, is what you're looking for in your preparation. And no cybersecurity strategy will eliminate all the risk. All you're trying to do is mitigate and minimize. Um, again, part of one of the important things to understand is what is your direct legal and regulatory requirements and to have those documented. Um, obviously, having your networks and environments mapped out and documented. Um, spending a little bit of time to identify the threats and vulnerabilities that are specific to your organization. Um, the, uh, to identify threats and vulnerabilities. Um, prepare your remediation measures. And a couple of key things here, have an incident response plan and team ready to go. So if you do have a cybersecurity and, or privacy incident, you're ready to deal with it right away. Third party security reviews, recommendations and remediation. Like I said, the engagement of third party experts, um, it really is a good time to do that. There are a lot of new security, cybersecurity protection strategies, and I'd encourage everyone to, uh, to think about engaging a third party to help update your cybersecurity plan. Also, there's lots of ongoing monitoring programs now that are available from different vendors. Well, they'll actually help you do ongoing monitoring. Uh, privacy and security policies, procedures, and safeguards, having uh, your proper uh, policies, procedures, along with obviously employee training, making sure you got the right contracts in place, which include uh, data protection schedules. You also include some security requirements. And I think lots of institutions now have gone to having an actual security checklist and questionnaire for their vendors. And that's a great way to show due diligence and also to help um, your vendors understand what it is you're looking for. That's been, I, I think, a very effective strategy that we've had lots of clients using. Cybersecurity insurance is obviously uh, something that people need to look at. Okay, um, your incident response. Have your IRP ready to go and um, take and, and follow it and trigger it. This is really the, the way of making sure you mitigate uh, whatever impact the, the cybersecurity incident or privacy incident has. You um, establish your legal privilege early on in your IRP, especially when you're engaging a third party to investigate. You wanna make sure that whatever's found in the investigation is protected by legal privilege. Don't make it easy for people to sue you afterwards. Uh, have a breach coach, notify your insurer, assemble your team, Eliminate the vulnerability and preserve evidence. And this is an important one because lots of times people will be so focused on mitigating the harm that they forget that you do have to make sure that you preserve the evidence so people can, the third party investigation that comes in afterwards can actually follow where the cybersecurity or where the cybersecurity, cyber, sorry, cyber criminal got into their system and what they got access to. That will be really important when you're trying to decide who you have to Tell about it and what your notification strategy is. Um, Randy. Again, yeah. Randy, sorry to interrupt. We, we do have a question, which I think is relevant for what you're speaking sure. about right now. Um, the question is, is can, can you recommend a few advisors that can help when there's a breach, an attacker holding IT systems uh, to ransom? Well, uh, what, I, what I will do, Adam, is we'll send out, I know there's lots of people that are part of um, uh, part of the organization that provide these types of services. So anybody online who provides these services may want to provide a notice, but we can also, um, after, after we're done, I'll send out a list of uh, vendors that we have used in different circumstances, Adam. Okay. Uh, we can send that out to everyone, all the attendees afterwards. We've got a list of people that we, that we recommend. Okay, thank you, uh, Randy. Okay, on word hold. Um, so in, uh, in phase three, the notification and reporting. So there, there's a whole legal framework for this, but one of the things I wanna say practically is do not leave this to your IT and security people to decide if a notice is needed. We've, been at, we've seen circumstances where clients have had a cybersecurity incident and they've rushed to notify 40,000 customers of the breach. And at the end of the day, when the investigation was done, it turned out that the layered security the client had put in place had done its job. And actually the cyber criminals hadn't got access to any personal information. So number one is they created a lot of undue angst and um, stress for their customers. And they also created a communications nightmare for themselves. 
So do not let this decision be made by IT security experts. It's a business and communication issue. It's a balancing of risks. And uh, again, we, we always, we, again, we just uh, exercise caution on this. Sometimes you need to send out an immediate notice where there might've been financial information um, that got out um, that you need to remind people to watch the credit cards, et cetera. But you can also, um, you can send out that type of immediate notice and then also say, but we're still carrying on our investigation which means you may be able to send a notice afterwards saying we've completed our investigation and no harm, no foul. And so um, it's really important that there's a communications strategy to your notification process, as well as uh, meeting your, your legal requirements. Now, um, your obligation to report to the, uh, to the OPC, this is one is what we found is with the exception of absolute massive incidents, the privacy commissioners are just being absolutely swamped with these notices. So there's very little to fear from providing the notice to the, uh, to the OPC. Um, they, they will only follow up on sort of the most sort of heinous of cases. This is happening all the time, every day, and they're just overwhelmed with the notification. So again, uh, th this is one where um, there's a set requirement as to what you notify. We recommend to people that they very much consider sending an interim and immediate notice to the OPC in case they're contacted by one of your customers. So the idea would be if you send a communication out to your customers at the same time you're providing at least an interim notice to the privacy commissioner. So if they get contacted, they can say, we've already been um, in communication with the company and they're sort of taking care of the cybersecurity incident. Now to, um, so the, the reporting requirements, um, I think the idea to notify other organizations, this is important in today's business environment because lots of times you'll have business alliances, business partnerships, um, where it may be important that the other organization also understands that there may be, that there may be harm or may be, they, there may be ways for them to reduce the risk of harm to their organization or their customer, okay? And on to the record keeping. So the record keeping is one where a lot of companies are not doing this properly. And if you do end up with an audit from the privacy commissioner, this is one spot they're gonna go to right away. Um, and so it's important that, that you've got this in place. And by the way, if OSFI comes in to do an audit or a review, they're gonna go directly to look for the record keeping to see if you've got it in place. I'm not gonna to say too much more about that. When you come back to the chart again, when you've had a, a minor uh, privacy or security incident, once you've done your record keeping, the information should flow back into the preparation. So it should, the risks, uh, the risks identified um, in the minor uh, cybersecurity incident should then go back into your preparation process so that you reduce and mitigate that risk in the future. It, one thing that I, I would say uh, from a higher level perspective is to remember that most IT security, uh, most sorry, most IT environments are very unique. They're more unique than people realize. And so that's the, one of the reasons why that whatever cybersecurity um, uh, policy and procedures and stuff that you have in place has to be unique to your environment and to uh, the people that you have in your company and your business. Okay, so things you can do. A couple things is engage your executive and your board. Make sure they understand the risk. Make sure they understand that you have to properly fund this, uh, this protection for your organization because all it takes one ransomware attack and your business is absolutely locked down. And if you, uh, and one of the interesting things is this happens way more often than people realize. And of course, nobody's out publicizing <laughs> you know, are publicizing their uh, cybersecurity incidents. Get your IRP in place, get your incident response plan in place, be ready to deal with things, update it and test it. Ensure your incident response team includes legal representation to protect privilege. So the investigation and review that you do um, is actually protected by legal privilege and ensure you got the right resources, a privacy officer, a security officer, along with the appropriate procedures, regular meetings, regular identification of risks, 
all of those kinds of things in the IT world, that's actually what reduced your risk over time is having the right process in place. Now, third-party experts, as I've talked about, th this is really the key. And again, I would suggest to, to everyone that they think of doing another one of these reviews, the strategies have improved over the years dramatically. Policies, procedures, and training, uh, we've already talked a bit about that. When a private security or privacy incidents occurred, ensure that it's reviewed, risk is assessed, goes back into your preparation process. Um, we are big fans of privacy impact assessments, especially where you're dealing with a big project that deals with a lot of customer information. This is a great way to identify the risks, and then that, again, goes into your preparedness step. Uh, standardized reporting, record keeping, again, I think we've, uh, we've already talked about that. OK. MLT Aikens, how can we help? This slide is a requirement of the MLT Aikens marketing department. Um, and so we, we help our clients with privacy compliance programs, with policies, procedures, employee training. We help with contract reviews. We create standard uh, data protection schedules, standard questionnaires, security questionnaires uh, for your vendors. All of that sort of um, work is, is, again, how we help our clients. We help our clients with their incident response plans. We help them deal with actual privacy and security incidents. As I've said before, we'll provide some information on a bunch of the different contacts that we have, but we, we've helped lots of clients deal with their privacy and security incidents. And also we can help folks with their record retention policies and other things related to the electronic storage of, of information. So there, um, Christelle, we can uh, give a check mark to our marketing department. Um, and so that's, that's all I've really got. And the, the real keys to me in this is the process is important and also um, important is the communication between the IT team and the compliance and business team. If they, and it's something that you really have to work on. And, and I would say in the majority of the incidents that we've been involved in, the lack of communication between those two groups has been uh, a key item that is actually either caused or contributed to the cybersecurity incident. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Randy. One of the questions that has been asked is, how common is it for the OPC to complete an audit? So <clears throat> we're seeing lately that um, the OPC is picking this up quite a bit. Um, as I mentioned, um, they've looked at the, the record keeping requirements um, and they're spot checking a lot more organizations. They were quite overwhelmed with all of the reports that they're receiving, but it's becoming more common. And we're, we're also seeing that the OPC is following up from reports that you know they were sent probably months ago or a year ago um, that you know now they're just following up to kind of cross cross their T's and dot their I's. So um, this does happen and we've seen it on a few occasions. Okay, thank you, Crystal. And, 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 and sorry, I just I would add I would expect, you know, with um with their increasing powers that that's something that'll just uh, increase as well. Okay, no fair enough. Thank you. Uh, another question is what are the risks and obligations related to data residency outside of Canada? services such as Dropbox residents or resident in the United States? Yeah, so um, I would say, I mean, whenever you are dealing again with, with residents who are in those other jurisdictions, you'll have to keep in mind that they might have specific additional requirements. And so, um, so you're following your Canadian requirements for the Canadian residents. But if you, for example, have California residents that are, um, you know, resident in California and using your services in some way, um, you'll, you'll have to potentially comply with the California laws as well, kind of California laws of some thresholds that you might um, be be able to um, you know not be directly required to comply with them um, but the GDPR doesn't so for example if you have one one EU residents information and they're in the EU and they're using your services your your risk is the same as almost any other organization that um, potentially you could be enforced again against if you're not following those requirements uh, with respect to that one EU resident. Yeah, and, and Crystal, maybe just to add to that, if um, 
if you've got, uh, if you're using services or using IT services that do uh, create this kind of data residency in the US or you're using a contractor um, based in the US, um, again, the Privacy Commissioner has very strict requirements, including that you have the right contract in place and also that you're notifying and looking for ways to get consent from your customers to that sort of uh, cross-border transfer of their personal information. And so you'll, you'll notice on a lot, of, um, a lot of websites that organizations in their privacy notice are talking about that they are using transborder services and exactly what transborder services they're using. Thank you, Randy. We, we have another question related to the OPC. And the question is, is does the OPC conduct uh, their audits with their own internal resources, or do they subcontract out to privacy consulting companies? Well, I think um, I think that probably depends. I think they're using their own internal resources, but there's certainly been talk of, of using external resources. And I think, you know, to the extent they need to supplement their resources, that that might need to happen as well. Okay, so it's just a matter of circumstance and and depending upon the circumstance and situation. That's right. Another, most of the people I've dealt with were internal um, OPC resources, but I have heard that they sometimes use external ones to supplement. Thank you. Um, we have another question and this, this deals with training. And um, the question is, is with training, we do exercises every month for all employees. Some employees continue to fail. And after each time they fail, we provide training, which I would assume be more training. Um, can we establish a policy indicating if you fail so many number of times that we can use our progressive discipline up to and including termination? And, and I guess we probably can't answer on the employment law side, but perhaps you can answer in, in terms of these type of training exercises and, and what you would normally see um, as a, a policy in place from an employer? Yeah, so that, that puts you in a very difficult situation because I mean, the, the types of, of exercises that you're doing um, are, are, are often the more basic things that you, you, you shouldn't, you know, you, you shouldn't be seeing people failing all the time. Um, and I think, you know, from an employment side that would have to be reviewed as to how you can rely on it. But yes, in the policies that we see for sure, um, you know, the training is, is a condition to you having access to, to that level of, of sensitive personal information. And if you're not meeting the requirements, um, so you're not able to provide the appropriate safeguards for that information, I think that impacts your ability to have access to that specific layer, um, that specific level. So, um, I mean, that might mean that your, 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 your duties change. I'm not sure exactly how that would work from an employment perspective. Um, but And you'd have to make sure that you're providing kind of the appropriate training and that would have to be specifically reviewed to make sure, um, you know, the standard of training that's being expected is appropriate. But I, I, um, I would think that that you know, does play into the safeguards that you can provide for that information if someone's not passing something on a repeated basis. Yeah, and no, just, no. just to add, uh, Christelle, that generally this is back to where it's important uh, that your cybersecurity training and program is actually part of your security policy. So that if somebody is in breach of it, it's similar to a breach of the security policy. Uh, you know, like leaving the door open. I mean, and that's almost what it is. And so if you make it part of your security, overall security policy and have it as a breach of that, that probably helps when you're talking about step discipline. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. What does it mean for data to reside in one country, example, the United States, but is then viewed or managed in a different company, in a different country, example, Canada. From a legal standpoint, is it about where the data resides or where it is viewed, managed? Since data is copied when viewed, what does residency really mean? 
So I think we've, we've seen different layers of this. So sometimes you can actually limit risk. Um, so basically, if your information is in, in Canada and you have some service providers who are able to only access that information and not keep kind of copies of that information, they just have to do your work on the Canadian servers, um, you still would have um, your information kind of resident in Canada. But as soon as um, someone's able to kind of take copies um, and, and have them on their own servers in their own jurisdiction. So for example, for the US, that might mean that um, it then becomes subject to the US authorities. And so, um, so, so you could run into the situation where it's potentially resident in more than one place, depending on what the restrictions are and what's done with that information. So that's something that is typically addressed in a data protection schedule in the contractual safeguards with your service providers. Yeah, and I think, Christelle, just to add to that, um, lots of times you'll have temporary access and uh, you may have like a support person um, in another country who's accessing the data temporarily to resolve a particular issue. And as part of your contract, you can have the requirement that the, the personal information is then deleted from that system that's outside of the country. So that can help clarify the data residence issue. But as Christelle said, you can certainly have the data resident in more than one country. Um, a copy of the information in the IT world doesn't really matter. It's treated the same way as the, quote, original version of the PI. But uh, what we built into a lot of the data protection schedules is where you have a person from another country accessing the information, that there's a requirement that they um, access the information and if they're temporarily using it on a system outside of the outside of Canada, there's a requirement that they delete it, and there's a certificate or process to uh, confirm, in fact, that that's been done. Okay, thank you. We have another question uh, for for well, let me take a step back here. So one one of the other questions is: It sounds like residency means both at rest and in transit. From, from our recent reply being uh, what you just said, Brandy, I, I think if you can confirm that. Sure, I think when you're talking about uh, data in transit, the, the answer is yes, that you end up with this sort of murky murky waters of, um, uh, of, of where it is actually resident. But the, the challenge is, is when you're talking about data in transit is when you're providing the notification to your customers, you can say that though. You can say our data resides in Canada, but from you know, but it is in transit through the U.S. or through other jurisdictions. And so you just you have to be able to explain it um, that way. And it's just a it's just a matter of risk as opposed to um, anything else. Okay, thanks. And another question is, how do you confirm that data has been deleted from a third party system? So it's a reasonability test. And so often what you can do is you ask for a certification from the third party that it's been deleted, um, a certificate signed by a senior officer of the organization. That's one way to do it, but there's no way to ever be absolutely uh, positive. The real question is, have you taken reasonable steps? And reasonable steps would include some type of certification from the third party that they've deleted it and that it will sort of be deleted out of its backups as it works its way through its regular, uh, you know, backup and restoration schedule. And the so, uh, progress, not perfection. No, fair enough. And, and the implications of a certificate being breached would be, I take it legal action, sort of in, in the common law or, or statutory regime. Absolutely. Okay. Like the faults, the fault signing of the of the certificate would certainly create a cause for legal action. Okay. For organizations wanting to prepare be prepared in advance, uh, will your firm being MLT Akins be providing consulting services going forward regarding the new federal privacy regulations and the impact to organizations? <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. So my that. mute button, unmute button disappeared. Um, yeah, so we'll certainly be um, preparing some some general uh, public information as well as uh, 
we're specifically able to help organizations with how it will apply to them as well. And I'll, I think we'll look to, to provide some, um, some training as well. And, and we do training that's uh, specific um, for organizations as well, if they'd like to, um, to use that, if they don't already have internal resources for that. So, yes. Okay. So we, we, unless somebody has any further questions, uh, we don't have any uh, existing questions that haven't been answered at this point. All right, well then, I think this is a, 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 as good a time as any to, to wrap things up and say uh, a huge thank you uh, to Randy, Adam and, and Christelle for that uh, very informative uh, hour. We, we went through a ton of really, really great content. Um, again, we'll be following up with a recording, so don't worry if you missed anything or weren't taking copious notes. Uh, and we'll also send the, uh, the uh, slide deck um, as well. So uh, again, thank you uh, so much for attending. Thank you, uh, MLT Akins, uh, for your amazing insights. Uh, and we'll see you all uh, at the next webinar. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.